Well, um, we wanted to, we were like, oh, we should have a special speaker. And we were like, this is our most special speaker for this year. Um, partly because Jose Rubin is out, but also because of the tremendous organizing he did inside. And that inspired over a hundred of us to fast in early April. It was between Passover and Easter that week that over a hundred people fasted in solidarity with the 77 people who were on hunger strike inside detention. So I thought, let's, let's hear a little bit from Jose Rubin. Um, I just want to just try to remember like how we even got connected. And this is why I just want to mention Floricel over there, who's like, who's kind of like Jose Rubin's auntie, neighbor auntie, yes. like comadre, of his mother and Floricel are comadres and very close. So we knew Floricel because of her campaign and this works like a chain, right? And so Floricel then reached out to us after a couple of years and said, my comadre's son is now in detention and is desperate. There, you know, your mom Rosario was really uh, like devastated. You were devastated. If I recall, you were, you were being told by lawyers there was no way, there's no way you could stay. And um, there was not much hope. You were thinking about signing those papers that they try to push on you, right? To sign away your rights for deportation. And so I said, Florida said, well, I don't know what we can do, but at, what we can do is we can tell Jose Rubin's story. Let's tell Jose Rubin's story. Let's just have people start knowing about him and knowing about what a great person he is. You know, kind of like saying your name. Like we didn't know what the advocacy, so our first advocacy action for Jose Rubin was like, read his story and pray because there really was no other Camino. There was just no other way that was evident. So that's how I remember the story. So I just want to see if that's how you remember the story and like what, what impact that connection had on you. This is supposed to be about him. I'm <laughs> no, thank you. Uh, thank you, everybody. Um, I must say that, um, yeah, it's, it's true. You know, um, being in the detention center uh, and, and uh, yeah, just basically having all these, uh, these, messages from like attorneys that I, there was like a seven percent chance that i would be able to get released you know so it was just something that it was difficult for me for me and our me and my family you know and it's like i felt hopeless you know and and by the i feel like by the grace of god um you know Fori said reached out to my mother and basically she told me to contact her immediately and yeah that's what i did and basically um what he said informed me like hey you know gave me encouragement like hey we just wait i already talked to reverend deb and that's when i first started hearing about reverend deb in the interfaith movement you know so i was just like okay it's like just don't give up you know what i mean just don't give up so she gave me that uh that uplift you know like that like that energy that that motivation you know the encouragement you know so i was just like all right like i just felt like all right like like Basically, hey, I'm gonna. There's a chance, you know. There's a chance, you know. This, uh, you know. So that basically built me up, you know. And just that faith, that strong faith that you know, she guys passed on, passed on to her, because she's telling me like things. She was telling me, you know, like, hey, you're gonna get out. You're gonna get out. Just know that we're working on it, you know. But that right there was just powerful for me. So I, that, to, to, if I could reflect on that, that was powerful for me. So. I remember, yeah, I was talk, communicating with Floricel in Spanish, and she was communicating with you. And then later she's like, oh, he speaks English. I'm like, oh, he speaks English. That would be so much better. <laughs> and then we talked on the phone. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but um, so you're from a Catholic family, and I remember talking to you on the phone, and you're like, one of the things that was keeping you alive was reading the scripture every morning. And you told me that Psalm 91, the Lord is my refuge, was one of your favorites, and that one of the ways you helped your family was you take your mom to church every Sunday yeah. and how much you missed that. And so it was like six years of incarceration then one and a half years of ice. Just tell me, tell me a little bit about how your faith helped you and especially around the hunger strike. Yeah. Um, I must say that, uh, through all my time, um, basically just scripture, you know, going to, uh, Bible studies, you know, all, you know, and with something that like, always kept me grounded, you know, it just kept me grounded in every way. Um, 
through all my struggles, I was able to like just have the assurance that God was my rock and my refugee. So, um, yeah. So basically, that was um, like even like I could reflect right now that like how it was mentioned, like like I used to take my mother to church every 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 Sunday. Every Sunday we would go to church, and after the, afterwards we would go to breakfast. You know, and now we now that I'm out, we continue that. Going. No, now that we're we're still keeping that that tradition going on, that we go now is now my dad is going with us. <laughs> so yeah, um, but I could say that through the through through the hunger strike, um, I must say that like I actually I one thing I wanted to share is like I actually fasted when I was like before detention. Like I tried fasting for, for ten days, so and that was to and I, I was there's supposed to be a secret between me and me and me and God, right? But like I'm then you guys like I actually fasted so um and that's something that I gave to him. That was my my offering to God. And I feel like through the hunger strike, um that's something that kept me grounded as well. Like just having that faith that, you know, at the same time knowing that Jesus Christ himself, you know, fasted for forty days and forty nights, you know, and and basically you know, and even knowing that how prophets used to fast, you know, so that's just something that I myself was like, I, I, that gave me the assurance that I'm going to be okay. You know, as God will be, God knows that everything, we're going through some injustices, some mistreatment, and I'm going to be okay because like I said, it's just my faith in God, my faith in my, my, from my spiritual side. So mm -hmm. let me just give them a little details on the hunger strike. This was, um, for yourself. You did the hunger strike for 21 days, um, water only, and it was in response to the Geo Corporation, which runs the private detention, and ICE ignoring the labor violations, basically paying detainees a dollar a day. So you'd already been on a labor strike for a year. There were com you had complaints, you and others had complaints about medical neglect, sexually abusive pat downs and contaminated water and no access to bottled water. So not only did you participate in this yourself, but you organized 77 people of different languages, different countries, different legal situations to participate this in this with you as well. Um, my question is, how did you, how did you, how did you sustain all the people to do this together and to work in a collective action. Yeah, um, one of the things uh, about being in detention, I uh, I try to do everything with. Well, I did everything with integrity, like with the goodness of with pure heart, like like. So, building relations with people inside detention is just something that was key because, like, having the having assuring them that you know not only myself but other leaders that were in detention that whatever they needed and any kind of support we were there we were there to offer that support you know because there's a lot of people that do not speak english there's a lot of people that need uh you know assistance in that certain sense and at times like yeah so basically anytime we needed they needed translation interpretation we were we were there so um and i must say through the we just we were just uh got to a point where we're like we had that unity you know we had that unity because we would have our, our weekly meetings or sometimes it would be month like before it before the hunger strike it was like a monthly meeting and basically we would talk about like issues like like for example there was a, one of our peers that was was not going to eat because he was just tired of the sexual abuse of pat downs at the same time everything the mistreatment so we, we came together and say we would have like meetings talk and talk about how can we support you know his, his situation, you know, and eventually like every time, you know, you know, just basically have, you know, you know, just support each other, like, because sip, like being patted down in an inappropriate way, it's, it's hard to, it's hard to bring up to the people, to, the, to bring it up to their uh, staff's attention. It's just, it's shameful, you know, because it's, it's like, like, I feel like, you know, but, uh, over time, like we've, we built that up, like to where like, we just, wait, wait a minute, we don't have to keep staying in silence. We have to let it be known, like, and basically like you know uh supporting other other folks to come up front like say like hey if you if, when they were they were they were telling us like hey yeah, this this officer touched me this way like hey go for it like they you, you know file the complaint because this needs to people need to hear this they need to they need to know that that that, that they need that this needs to stop 
So I could say that, um, you know, eventually we, we just got fed up just because of the constant retaliation, the mistreatment, you know, like just our, whatever we were asked, well, everything that we were asking for was not getting answered. All, all we were getting is retaliation. So, but the way, the, mo the way that we were able to keep, you know, everybody like, you know, was just through these weekly meetings while we were on a hunger strike. Eventually it, we started taking a little bit more time off because like, when you're fasting, it's just like you're becoming more weak and and you don't have the energy to just want to gather up everybody. So, but when we had these meetings, you know, um, you know, we would, you know, bring up, you know, any updates, you know, any updates of what's what's going on, you know, what, what's our next steps, you know, and 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 we would end up with prayers, you know. So, but one of the things that we all make, we all had this clear is just that is that. If I don't, if we don't get out, maybe the next person, as long as somebody gets out, as long as somebody gets released, you know, as, and at the same time, let's make a change. Like maybe it might be for us right now, but it may be for the next person behind us, you know, like before, like after us. So that was something that, uh, that kept us, kept us going, you know, so, and always just, just checking up on people, like being like, Hey, how, you know, asking folks, how are you guys feeling? How are you guys doing? You know, making sure that they're, they're doing okay. You know, so. Um, that was one of the, how we sustained it. Why don't you share a little bit about what ISIS, how did ICE react? What was, what do you feel like the reaction was, what you experienced to the fast? Yeah, um, I, I, I want to say like after 18 days of, of fasting, uh, you know, we had, we were, we got a visit from geo, geo staff, like geo officers mm -hmm. dressed up in riot gear, you know, and we got a visit from the same day. We got the same visit from ICE officials, ICE officers dressed up in military gear, like with with automatic rifles. Mm -hmm. They come inside our, into our dorm and basically yelling us to get down, you know. And me myself personally, like I was basically I, I I sat down, and they told me, "Hey, get up!" And I was like, "Hey, can I please talk, speak to my attorney?" They responded with just grabbing me from my leg, dragging me, and throwing me on the ground, and basically yanking my arms behind my back. And they would, they told me that the one thing they told me is like, if either you walk or we're going to drag you, you know? So I just felt like that, uh, like, I don't know. Like I was like, this is not right. Like it just brought me black back flashbacks. Like when I was a kid, it brought me black flashbacks when I was a kid, when like my brother was shut by ice. Like when, when ice stormed into our apartment when we were kids, you know, and I was only like a five-year-old, you know, and my father, my brother was an eight-year-old, eight or nine-year-old. And he was shut by ice. So, it, so to me, it's like this. Like I said, I, the people that you thought that on their and on their standards, they say that they're there to protect us. It's the people that I, it just they don't change. They're there to harm us. They, to me, I felt like I was harmed all over again. You know. So that was my my experience. You know, feeling afraid, going and basically being placed. You know, being placed in an airplane, like not knowing if I'm going to make it back home. Like if I don't know if this land plane's in Atlanta. Not knowing if my, uh, you know, how worried is my mom? Like she, she's not, she, she doesn't know my whereabouts. You know what I mean? So she's not gonna know. So I just felt scared, completely scared, terrified. And once I got to Texas, you know, the first thing that uh, the regional medical director told me, you know, which her name was Dr. Iglesias, she basically told me like, the reason why you guys aren't here is because you guys aren't eating. And just believe that we're gonna do everything in our power to make you guys eat. And she taught, she described the the, the 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 force feeding procedure, and which was uh, strapping us down to a bed and basically running tubes down our nose, down to our esophagus, and pumping liquid food into us, which is just completely terrifying. Like, and being that I was on a medical isolation by myself, every time they opened up my my door, like I always I was always scared, like I was terrified, like thinking that when is is this the day they're gonna come and drag me out of you know? So eventually, you know, me and my my peers that were transferred that way which is me and other three folks you know three of my peers uh we decided that we we're gonna you know eat and with the prop because they basically gave us the assurance that by us eating we're gonna come back to california so in that time i was asking for for uh for electrolytes and, and vitamins in which they basically denied me all these things so before even refeeding again so which they what they ended up giving me is just giving us is two large burgers and a large pot of fries which too many calories to consume, you know, for your first meal. So yeah, that's basically after that, that it's caused me to have, you know, suffer from neurological problems, you know? So um, yeah, but uh, uh, besides, after after that, I was I came back to California 
and I was hospitalized four times. I was hospitalized for four days in one in one situation, and like, like even having experienced the torture there as well. Like, I was basically handcuffed to my arms and my and my. They had a chain around my waist, and then I was you know handcuffed to to my bed. Like, and I had to sleep a whole night like that. I couldn't even sleep. Matter of fact, because because of I just felt like. Like I, I'd rather go back and not get treated than, instead of being tortured, you know what I mean, like in this matter. So that was difficult. But I could say that, um, you know, through my core hearing, you know, knowing that, you know, how everybody was moving, like interfaith was like like a huge role with like, like even through even like when I was still in the, like when I was during my hunger strike, like the letters of support I was getting, you know, the, uh, the support, you know, to me, I just felt so empowered, like, Throughout my time, like of me knowing and speaking to to Reverend Deb and 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 there, you know, here, you know, taking taking my story, I just felt like I I wasn't a I wasn't gonna be okay, you know what I mean? Because I had that support. They they made me feel empowered. You guys made me feel empowered in all reality, like, and that kept me that had me kept me going forward, you know, uh, knowing that I I we're not alone, you know, because that's 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 key right there. Being inside of the tensioners. You could feel alone, you know, if you don't, if, but uh, when you know that you got support like this, you know, it was a beautiful thing to me, you know, so in my core hearing, uh, it was a blessing that I, that I got granted bond, and um, yeah, but um, just, I just want to thank you guys from the bottom of my heart, because without y'all, I wouldn't be here, I wouldn't be standing here, then this, this is a dream come true to me. Well, uh, Jose has been giving testimony all over the place. And this month, in fact, there is a federal um, investigation that's happening yeah. of Mesa Verde um, from within ICE. So we'll see what that does. But I want I always want to, just in closing, just to give you a chance to share a little bit for folks about what you're doing now. I know you're, um, and for Interfaith Movement, once you got out, we're like, Especially this guy who's like Pastor Jose. We have to get <laughs> Pastor Jose involved with the interfaith movement. Um, you know, so you've become, you've been one of our faith advocates. You're part of the cohort that Gayla and Danny lead. And now, as we're thinking, as we're planning for our October pilgrimage to the six, not seven anymore, the six remaining detention centers, you're part of the organizing team for the pilgrimage. But just share a little bit about what that means for you and about the pilgrimage. Yeah. Um... I just feel like, you know, you guys are giving me a chance to be a part of something. Like, this is something that I love doing. Like, like even through the intention, like just being in community, not knowing that there's a community out here like this, and being now being out here with the community. Like, to me, this is huge to me. Like, this is because I heard about the pilgrimage of, of 2020, 22. You know what I mean? So I was, you know, I was in detention and hearing about this, and I was like, I, in my mind, I was like, I want to be out there and, and be part of that someday. And I'm gonna say that like. As of right now, I'm living a dream because I'm like basically working and being part of that, you know, in the, in the recruitment of, of you know, a directed impact leaders. Um, but um, to me, this is a dream come true. I must say, like, cause that's something that I was like, man, I want to like when I hear like, you know, any action that took place, you know, I was like, I want to be out there. I want to do that. I want to do that. You know, so it's just, this is huge for me, and uh, I want to just thank you guys for this, this, this amazing, this amazing opportunity. You know. Yeah, let's just join and just give Jose our appreciation and just know that you continue to have our prayers in your ongoing journey of recovering from that trauma and health and growth and learning and going back to school this fall and stuff. We are just really, really behind you. I you didn't know that. On behalf of Interfaith Movement for Human Integrity, we would like to offer you these flowers, which bloom in such beauty, but cannot compare to the beauty of your soul and the strength and courage and love that you carry for yourself and humanity. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.